forward to this computer. All right, everybody. Welcome to Tiger Talk Thursday. Um, we have Riley Foster in the house. This is episode 39 of Transitioning to Life After Sports. And actually, we've got quite the spin on this one. Um, so I'll give you a little backdrop on Riley, and then she's going to share her amazing um, athletic career with us and, and what she's had to go through. So she is actually a Cambridge, Ontario native who is destined to be one of the greatest goalkeepers of all time times when it comes to soccer. So ever since her introduction to the youth national team, Riley has brought forth a unique and highly skilled mentality to the world of football. For those of you football, I'm referring to soccer. All right. Um, after attending university of West Virginia university, Riley went on to sign her first professional deal with one of the most known football clubs in the world, Liverpool. FC in 2020. And she was called up to the Canadian senior national team in February of 2021, where she was then a part of consecutive camps leading up to the Tokyo Olympics. Then the unexpected happens. She broke her neck, broke her neck in seven places, fracturing her lower back in two and sustaining numerous other severe injuries due to a traumatic car accident. She's now resi resiliently working hard to defy the odds and be back to playing football better than she was when she last strapped up her gloves. So welcome, Riley. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love your story because, you know, in this series, we talk to athletes that are navigating life after sports, whether it be to injury, retirement, or unforeseen circumstances. And typically there's no returning back to their sport at that time. But what's really neat is to see the transition you have gone through. And I want to go back to, let's start with your, your playing career as a, your younger years and how it took off. And then we'll get into the accident and what that transition was like with you. So kind of like your youngest memory, or do you come from a soccer family or where's the love of soccer come from? Yeah, definitely come from a soccer family. My um, dad's family is from Liverpool. So I grew up, watching football every single morning like my dad would go and get Tim Hortons from the Timbits back to the table and we'd be watching the game um but it was actually uh, a motive for my parents to put me in because I was the extremely energetic out of control child and it was essentially free daycare so I got put into football because of that and then yeah I just happened to be good at it and it I took off my dad coached me for a while but then I exceeded his um credentials I think it's the best way to say it respectfully uh and then yeah now here I am amazing so when you start to get those calls and other teams calling you up um did you know did you feel that you were any like did you notice there was something different here that you were really excelling at it or, or um you know like what was that because transitions are part of are part of life and those new experiences what would you say was the biggest change for you or the biggest move when you had to transition you know you're not under the roof of mom and dad anymore and what was that like for you for some athletes that are potentially listening or struggling with that transition I think for me personally uh, I've had two moments of transition and they're quite different but also the same I think going from being a local kid in Cambridge training with the national team going up and down the 401 to train at the OSA um, <laughs> and then all of a sudden now I'm going to college and I'm independent. I'm studying and I'm going to training. I don't have my parents to talk to in the car on my rides home. Um, it was just very different. So that was like transition number one. Uh, and having to navigate all that was quite challenging, but I guess you just find routine and you get into it. It just becomes your normal day to day. Um, but yeah. then it was being in a driving distance from six and a half hours to now a seven and a half hour flight moving to Liverpool. And that was different because now I'm playing for my career. I'm paying for my wage. I'm, I'm playing for every training session, my job interview. And that was very different for me. And now not only do I not have my parents able to drive uh, to come see me, it's a flight and we're in a different time zone. And now I'm not able to actually connect with them when always needed. So it was a bit of a different scenario losing that family and I have a very tight family and a very communicative family so losing that ability was quite challenging um, yeah. but again I've, I've always known I was different um, I felt like I was just setting goals that were like not normal compared to my peers like I go to school and I'm like oh I'm gonna go to the Olympics my friends are like oh I want to work at Starbucks and I'm like uh, <laughs> 
we're not on the same page. So that was kind of when I was like, I knew that I was destined for something different. And I think everyone has a path, but like it was the mindset that set me apart from the majority. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that resonates with me. I've always uh, had big lofty goals. Even one of them in the summer, the summer moment was like, do you ever just want to do something easy, Janine? And I was like, no, <laughs> I was no. telling about my <laughs> book writing idea anyways. So you go, I, I love that you shared those transitions, especially as a younger uh, athlete, if someone that is tuning in or listening or for parents of younger athletes that are moving away. I mean, I left home at I would have played hockey at 17 when I went to the university of New Hampshire. Um, but you're like seven hour flight. It's not, mine was a seven hour drive. So a seven hour flight is way yeah. different. And let's say for just for those of you listening, I mean, I'm in Ottawa, Ontario in Canada right now it's 9 11 PM and you're Thursday the next day. And you're what, is it 2 11 PM there? Yeah. 2 yeah. 11. So that's crazy. So amazing amazing soccer slash football career. I know what we call it in Canada versus um, where you're playing now. The unexpected happens. There's a car accident and it literally at that moment, I'm sure felt like your whole life was going to be completely different. And I'm sure it is completely different from be since before the accident in a sense, because of I know what it's like when we go through life experiences, but take us if you don't mind and you're okay to back to the accident and what was going through your mind. Yeah, I was just coming off of probably a, a high in my career. I mean, I had a match on the, I want to say it was the 13th or the 12th of October. Um, like player of the match, making a penalty save the, the lights on me. And I thought, oh, time to take a little bit of a break. I went to go see a friend. I went to go see Drake in concert. Um, I didn't see Drake in concert. So bummer number one, not seeing Drake <laughs> in Finland. Um, exactly. But no, I know. <laughs> yeah, that's the worst part of it at all, really. But no, I don't want to see. When the accident happened, I don't have much recollection of probably the first 15 hours. But I do know that the uncertainty and the loss of control that I felt was probably the scariest thing um as athletes we live off of scheduling regime routine um we know our bodies inside and out because that's what we pay most attention to and to lose control of mine um and have other people telling me this that and not being able to see certain things work and it, you just lose all autonomy and that was probably the scariest thing it's losing my independence but then mm -hmm. on top of that thinking what's next like what what now I, I I remember sitting in ICU neck brace and not able to move my feet and my legs and I thought I can't I that can't be me like that's not me and everyone always says it's a path for you like everyone's destined to go a certain way but my way has always been football it's all I've ever known um I've literally devoted my entire life to it so I remember just sitting there feeling like I've lost control of everything and that it was the end. Like, I didn't know myself outside of my sport, which was probably not the smartest thing uh, for my younger self, but also the accident was most eye-opening experience for me. So completely changed everything. Yeah. It's crazy when you're saying that I'm actually covered in chills right now. And a lot of the <sighs> things that I speak to with the athletes is, you know, cause I do work with um, some younger athletes and I'm like, sports are what you do. They're not who you are because for a long time I identified with the athlete and ev all the professional athletes that I've talked to on here, um, different, even no matter what sport, the older, wiser uh, athletes that have come on, they've shared that their parents or someone had shared with them, you know, sports are what you do. They're not who you are. And that was just like, Pow. it's so simple, but it's so true. So I, I was just thinking that as you were sharing that, how important it is for parents, please, if you are listening in and athletes, because you do need to dedicate what you dedicate to your sport. It is you live and breathe it. You're proud to be a, a footballer, right? You, that, that gives you some swagger when you walk in the room, wouldn't you say? I mean, you're proud to put the Jersey on. You're proud to be with your teammates, you know, the traveling, getting off the plane. I remember getting off on trips and you have your, you know, you're decked out in your team uniform. It brings you so much pride. I get, I get actually worked up even just sharing that. So that was the first thing that came to me when I said, I was like, oh, your identity, like when you sat there and I mean, your leg, yeah. you weren't moving from the hips down. Is that what you said? Or yeah, like I could feel my legs, but I couldn't move my legs. Mm. 
and it was the most reverse thing ever like I remember jumping around dancing before I got in the car and now I'm bed bound catheter looking around the 60 plus year olds around me and I just was like what has happened in a blink of an eye wow and so yeah what's next so like if you could take us back to kind of that emotional and that journey of you know this wondering okay what now like who am I without soccer because that's where my destiny was and your vision um you must have felt I would imagine if you felt that disconnect like did you feel you went through a little like what was the how was what was the time frame and was there like a a depression type feeling or like for someone who's going through it, I just want to really normalize for another athlete who might be injured or worried about what's next. Cause sometimes I feel like people feel like it's a negative if you think they're down or they're not feeling cause athletes as athletes, we're so used to being the happy go lucky yeah. energetic one. Right. And then they're like, Oh no, they're yeah. going to get depressed and they're never going to come back from this. But did you go to that dark place? Um, yeah, a hundred percent. I think um, in my circumstances, you would have to be absolutely insane, psychotic even, to not go through the emotional turmoil that I went through. Um, I never hid the fact that I was in a deep depression. Um, I still don't hide the fact that I'm medicated. Like, it is what it is. I, I literally faced the Grim Reaper. What do you want me to do? Smile through it? Like, it's not how it works. Like, mm -hmm. I just lost my whole identity and I had to rediscover myself. So I owned my emotions and my feelings. I know injuries... Just the basic injury in the sporting environment is very turbulent. You go through highs and lows, you go through setbacks, and it's hard because you're removed from the playing field and you're withdrawn from teams and you're just not who you are. Except mine was on a traumatic level. Mine was on a level where it wasn't a football injury. It was a car accident. And now I'm dealing with elements of depression from being removed from sporting world, but also PTSD, uh, trauma, uh, grief, anxiety because I can't go near cars and like there's so many layers to what was going on in my brain and it was so hard to pick apart but I do remember one thing and I was laying in the hospital bed my dad had flown to Finland to come see me and we were kind of creating a plan because that's what we've always done we've created plants and we needed an identity with this and I remember him saying to me like okay well what do you need right now and I said well I need a therapist oh. like I, I need to talk to someone and um I said, I'm not gonna be able to do this on my own. He said, well, you have your family. I said, yeah, but like, I need someone to, who gets it. I need trauma therapy. I need all of this. And that was the reality of my experience. And the sad thing is I went through so many ups and downs and setbacks being told I'm never going to play again. And then being told, oh, it's possible. So then you, you change your perspective, you change your plan. And it was so much change. And I didn't like that. I don't like change. I like to be in my place, but I'm an athlete and change is like never ending. Yeah. So it was honestly like, I remember laying in my bed some night, just absolutely empty, gone. And like, everyone's like, oh, you're so happy. How are you getting through it? I am probably the best actress you'll ever meet because the fact <laughs> that I just had to hide and, and put forth front this face. Like, I'm not going to let other people down by being mopey and sad, but I will talk and be honest with how I felt. Uh -huh. Um yeah, it was so hard. It was no, hard. that, that, <laughs> that honestly it. resonates with me. I remember when one of my fitness studios going through a, a bankruptcy, it wasn't, a, it was, I was bawling my eyes out of my car, but I had a full fitness studio that I had to go show face. And as I think what it is for me, when I hear you say that you're professional and you're not trying to make everyone else feel sorry for you. So even when I went through breast cancer, I mean, my friends are always like, don't you feel sorry for yourself? Why are you so happy? And I'm like, well, it's not going to take my cancer away or, you know, but, exactly. but I would have my moments by myself or it's, I, it's an interesting that you say that I, I resonate with that. And I imagine there's a lot of athletes cause you're used to turning it on, right? It's like game on yeah. and you kind of sideline your emotions. So you're used 100%. to that. You're almost, you're almost trained to do that. Exactly. And I was talking to some of the guys at training today, actually. And uh, they, they asked me like, do you cry like what's it having because I have an interview coming out tonight and I said well was it hard like do you get emotional I was like I actually never cried like I never cried I got the halo on and I was I cried then because my life was literally over but um yeah I didn't cry I still don't really cry I haven't I can count on my hands one hand how many times I've cried since my accident and that goes to share like you do put a game face on your job is to 
when you're an athlete and you play at the professional level, your job's to entertain. That's mm -hmm. what you are. You're a, like, you're a professional entertainer. People come and watch you play and you just have to be like loving what you do. But when you're interacting with fans, no fan wants you to like, you don't want to hear someone else's sob story. So why am I going to go tell someone else my sob story? Like my job is to make you happy. So I'm going to do my job still, even if I'm incapacitated or whatever it might be. Um, so yeah, it was a really hard balance to like, make sure that I was putting myself first um, while yeah. still being able to do my job at some level. So um, yeah, and that would be, that's the tough one. And it's almost because you're almost getting still the same attention, but from a different side. So it's not until the attention is kind of quiet um, that I find you really have to get a chance to process those emotions. So I imagine too, like when you're first in the accident, it's game on, but it's the attention you're getting. It's like your professional athlete, but it's just a magnitude of a ton of other attention. Right. And then when it's kind of quiet, it's like, what the hell just happened? Did, does that resonate with you? Did that, did you kind of feel that? Yeah. Yeah. So like, I would say, it's one of those things my accident has been in the public eye uh, and I was okay with that because there's an element of giving back to the people and I knew my story could change lives um, also being the open character that I am I wanted to make sure that people knew that I was progressing and knowing the potential that it was going to be one of the biggest comebacks in history it's like I'm you like a open. challenge you love a challenge <laughs> yeah, yeah I, so I put myself out you're there. like it's let's like, do this I, like, yeah, like, I'm like, I'm signing the contract. I'm doing this. Like, I'll, I'll make the comeback. And I guess I actually texted my therapist. He's a great guy, by the way. I have him on speed dial. Like, he is <laughs> legend. <laughs> Shout out to Mark. But uh, basically. <laughs> Who's your therapist? I remember Mark. He's a legend. He's with Willow Grove. And honestly, 10 out of 10. But yes. basically, I remember sending him a message when I got to New Zealand. Um, signed my contract. I worked all this time in. The attention was positive. And I say positive, not that the attention of my accident wasn't positive, but it was, I'm playing again. And then like, it's like the dust has settled. The ashes are done. Like everything's like no longer like on fire. And I sat no, I said to him, my message was like, no one talks about the quietness after you've achieved everything you've been working for and your life's work has been put into it. And I, I didn't realize how low I would be either which is like not discussed at all because you would think I'm on top of the world. I achieved like literally the unheard and I'm feeling low. I, it didn't make sense to me, but it's exactly that quietness, that like lack of attention there, call it. It's when your, your brain starts to think. And I was like, wow, this is it's too spicy for me. <laughs> yeah. So this is, this is since your return. Yeah. So, cause it, uh, let's go back. I just want to, I want to talk about that, but that makes a lot of sense. Cause you know, as athletes, you know, we're so used to the external validation and then it's um, like the cheering you're just used to, you're used to it all. And that's an interesting perspective. So you're told you're never going to play again. How yeah. long is that period until when did you have an, a moment where you're like, this might not be my reality. So, and when I think about this topic and, and this series about life after sports, you know, for some athletes, your injury might not be career ending, even though it feels like it. And how, what was that transition like for you? How do you go from, I mean, you kind of strike me as someone who's, if I said, all right, you got to jump over this fire, you're, you just be like, okay, let's figure it out. <laughs> so you kind of, well, that's exactly you know, what it was like. <laughs> so like, I remember being in hospital in Finland and, this is like kind of off topic, but on topic. They said in order for you to leave the hospital and to be able to fly home, you need to be able to sit yourself up and do this upright x-ray. I was like, I'm doing that x-ray. <laughs> Push myself up, athlete. throwing up everywhere. Like absolutely threw up everywhere because my brain injury is that bad. I didn't know what to do. I was I'm pushing myself up. So that was probably part one. When I was told that I would be fine in Finland, Three months gonna be back playing. Oh, sweet! Like, I'm good. Seven days later, I get to Liverpool, and I'm being told, "You may never play again. This halo is probably not gonna work. You actually have seven fractures, not three, and this injury is gonna take years to like heal." And I, I remember thinking, like, oh, "That's that's a bit interesting. That's not what I was told." Like, I had the game plan already figured out. I knew what was gonna happen, and then. Mm now it's like throw this curveball like you actually might need 
like spinal fusion surgery and you're probably never going to be independent again, let alone like be able to move your head up and down left to right. And that was like, whoa, okay, um, nice. Fast forward a few minutes or a few months, sorry. And I get to like, I was in the halo for six and a half months. And I remember like month five, we weren't seeing much progress. So I was like, oh, it's happening. Like we're going under the knife, we're fusing my spine, it's happening. And then like three weeks, two weeks prior to the removal, the scan sh randomly showed like bone fusion and all my bones coming back together in my neck. And it was like the most, like, I kid you not, one week we were, I was on the phone with the doctor saying, like, it's not happening. I was on a, they call them like MDT meetings, a massive panel of doctors. And they're all looking at my scan, planning the surgery. And then I'm getting a call saying, actually, this is working. And there's only one area that's not healing, but like, that's okay. You can come out of it. So two weeks later, I was out at the Halo. And I thought, that's, this is it. Game's on. Like, I'm doing this. And that was kind of like the first moment. And I, I kept it very internal. I didn't outwardly show it because I was afraid of over-promising and under-delivering mm -hmm. to the public I, and my family and also to myself. But in my head, I thought, I'm doing it. And then when I was in rehab, I had a lot of setbacks. I had a torn quad in rehab. How you tear a quad in rehab? <laughs> news to me. I was barely moving. So news. Um well, you're breaking barriers operation. already, so why not tear it? <laughs> exactly. I was like, I just had to even the body out. Um, but like the, the reality was like, it was just so backwards. And I thought, oh, maybe this isn't for me. This is hard. Like this rehab is like, oh, it was so vigorous. It's six hours a day, every single day of the week. And I, I just like mentally, you, you just can't handle it. So I thought maybe it's not. And then I had a shoulder surgery right before I was making the full comeback. Six, so six April. hours a day consecutively? Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. I'd be like, up? I would be in for like three hours doing like the rehab side of things, um, and like treatment and all that. And then I'd have a lunch break, and then I come back and do like another three hours of like strength training and conditioning. Yeah, it was long. I wonder, <laughs> so you know, long. for. I mean, I feel like as athletes, you know, the mentality, especially high-level professional competitive athletes the mentality is, you know, the drive to do that and put in that time. Was there, I'm sure there were some days where you wanted to quit, but you just, obviously you to have that fighting mentality or I'm sh for anyone listening who might be going through a similar situation or different, different experience and accidents, but uh major injury. Did you want to quit at times? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I would rock up to the, the treatment place where I was doing my treatment at uh, rehab for performance in Liverpool. And I would straight up say, I don't want to be here today. I don't want to be here this week. Or I got to a point in my rehab where I was like, I need a break. And I remember this one break I took, I went to Dominican and I spent like 10 days there. It literally took me all my willpower to get on the plane and come back. Hmm. I didn't want to go back. I was like, I'm done. I, I like, this life is okay for me. I'm okay with settling. And I had laid out little things or like the next steps would have taken me outside of the sport. Um, and I was, I was ready to be done. And there were also times where I thought like, it's, it's impossible. Like this comeback's impossible. I, I, as much as I wanted to be in the gym, I wanted to make the comeback. I was like, it's just, it's not worth it. It's too dangerous. Um, I'd take the easy way out. But I, the, those moments didn't last very long. I, I'll be honest. They were like a week, if that. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it just normalizes how, you know, even the best of the best want to quit. And I think it's important for people to realize that it's just human nature. Um, so I appreciate your authenticity and, and uh, honesty there. So the halo's off, you're, you're rehabilitating. Was there a day that really stands out to you in your rehabilitation where you were like, holy shit, this is actually happening. Like this is, and you felt mostly yeah. like yourself. <laughs> I think there is a moment, um, I wouldn't say I was exactly myself, but it was like the 2.0 version of me. Um, I was laying on one of the treatment beds with this device attached to my head with chains hanging off of it and weight attached to it. And I was curling it with my neck. Oh, wow. And I thought, yeah, like full on Mike Tyson mode, curling <laughs> weight Seriously. with my neck. <laughs> 
<laughs> like, what, would you be doing it like insane. this? Like you're trying to curl like yeah. this? Yeah, like I would be laying on a bed, curling weight. Like I had oh, 20 wow. kilos hanging off of this. Wow. And then like curling forward and then doing it laterally, like actual neck curls. Like do isometrics for your neck, manuals with weight. Wow. And I thought to myself a couple of times, like I remember talking to my family, telling the stories. So I'm like, there's no way in heck I'm doing all this for no reason. There's no way. Like, who, who, why am I doing this? And in my head, I'm thinking, no, this is the moment. This is the, this is the drop of the coin. I'm, I'm this strong. And I remember my numbers being like equivalent to like rugby players. And I thought, mm, yeah, my neck's never <laughs> broken again. Like, I I'm love, good. I so, love it. <laughs> you know, I talked to a lot of younger athletes and, um, the big one that comes up for them is confidence. And you can tell you've got lots of confidence, which is great. And, um, and you need that. I do believe, I mean, you got to have a certain level of confidence and belief in yourself to get to that next level. Um, but what would you, what advice would you say for some younger athletes who are maybe struggling with confidence? What would you, what advice would you give them? I think it's trust. Um, and that, that's kind of like a double-edged sword, but trust yourself. Like, I, in, in professional sport, but also in the elite level of sport, growing up to want to be the top, and you, you struggle with confidence. And I went through that as, as a kid. And the one thing that I could always count on was myself. I could expect myself and count on myself to perform every single day, whether it was 100%, 90%, 10%. I was given 100% of whatever was in that tank. And I knew that no matter what the external factors were, I was showing up. You're where you are for a reason. People are bringing you into environments for a reason because you are good enough. Yeah. And it's trusting yourself to be able to do that, that task at hand. And confidence to me is one of those things. And a lot of athletes, you get on a good round and you start performing really well. And that's when your confidence grows. And then you have one bad game and it knocks you back. But that one bad game really is this big in the yeah. grand scheme of things. It's so tiny. Um, and that's what I had to remind myself is that this is a small moment in my career, a small mm -hmm. moment that no one's going to remember. Probably maybe <laughs> the accents it's kind of been on Google for a while, Yeah, but like those little days that aren't that good. No one's going to remember that mistake ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just enjoy the moment and just have fun with it and trust that you can do it. Like you're there for a reason. For sure. Now, where does this mindset come from? Is it, I, you mentioned that you and your dad always made a plan and he coached, but, um, cause again, there's, you know, what can these athletes be putting in their tool belt for? Cause for me, um, I love meditation. I got that. I got into that after my breast cancer journey. I did not meditate when I was playing hockey. I wish I knew about mindset work when I was playing hockey, but I'm a little bit, I've got about 20 years on you, maybe about 18 years on you. I'm in my forties. You're 25, right? <laughs> Yeah. 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 I'll be 42 in December. So, um, meditation, visualization, uh, journaling, uh, mindset work. Like I'm always listening to podcasts to get better. Um, I'm always listening to in the work. Like I don't listen to music when I work out. I listen to motivational stuff on YouTube. Um, ha did you do any of that stuff growing up or what do you do in the, when you're not playing football? Yeah. So growing up, my dad and I used to work on this a lot and it was cause I used to get in my head a lot, my own head, like it was crazy. I was like, the problem was never my talent. It was my own brain. And That's we the used way to it drive, always is right for people. Yeah. Always, always. Yeah. And like, we used to drive down the 401, an hour and a half drive to Toronto on the daily. And my dad would be like, <laughs> okay, I want you to practice your visualization. I want you to practice making that save in your head. Close your eyes and just think. And it's so weird to think about, but like, that's what my dad had me doing at a young age. Oh, I just but, got chills. Your dad's a smart man. I know. Yeah. He, he, my dad did a lot of research and I'll give him the credit, but I will say my resilience and my mentality actually comes away from the sporting world. It's watching my parents and my sisters sacrifice everything. Um, and watching them go through tough times because we had to play sports. And that was just the reality. Watching my parents leave their job and seeing how, much effort and time and energy that they put in and sacrifices they made just for us kids to play the sport that we love and to be successful. Um, so I guess the determination and the mentality comes from that, seeing it in a blue collar mentality and yeah. seeing that literally every single thing that you do every single day counts towards something. Like you nothing know, gets handed to you. It comes with sacrifices and it comes with uh, tough times. And my parents were the, epi like, the epitome of that. Like, my mom being hearing impaired, um, completely deaf working and being a real estate agent and having to do phone calls and not hearing anyone 
like that's what I got to witness my dad like literally giving up job promotions just so we could go to sport like that's what I grew up watching um wow. and I think that's humbling but also shows a mindset of what it takes to be the best and get to the top yeah absolutely um resiliency is the name of the game and that's what I, that's where, uh, I was listening to a talk. It was Simon Sinek and a, a basketball player. And they were talking about, you know, how great teams keep winning and all these things. And they were talking about constantly adding chaos. You add chaos. Like that's why, you, you know, you bring in new players, it changes up the dynamic and then you're never on your, you got to always add chaos. So you never get comfortable, right? That's how the, your posing yeah. team gets better. Um, but your family sounds like a pretty incredible group of people. So, um, kudos to them because you can see it you can hear it in your voice you're confident um and i can feel your belief in yourself so i'm really excited for you and what's what's to come and and uh, i'm so glad that you're you know here with us today to speak to it and and be able to inspire athletes around the world um and let them know you know what seemed like was going to be your life after sports story it's kind of the beginning of your comeback story and that you know we don't know where that is yet so um any final words for anyone listening kind of on the topic around again, it's those unforeseen circumstances that really change our lives. And, and when we're having to go through them, any final, any, maybe something I haven't asked or something that you've had gone through behind closed doors. Cause the main mission of these conversations is to help those suffering in silence around the globe and let them know, you know, you're not alone. Um, we all yeah. go through something. Um, but yeah, do you have any yeah. last words? I think for me, two things. Um, the first thing is the moment you're in is that moment. Embrace it. You're never going to have it again. Whether it's high, whether it's low, whether it's negative or positive, embrace it. Those feelings, those emotions, those are all valid. You have every right to feel how you feel in a, in a moment. And that's the one thing that got me through the adversity that I've been through is just embracing those feelings, speaking about it, being out loud with it and, yeah. and not hiding from it. Because the moment we succumb and try to stuff things down, that's when the bottle gets too full and it's like putting a Mentos in the Coke bottle. It's going to explode. Eventually yeah. it's going to be that last bit and it's not going to look pretty. So embrace that, embrace those moments and celebrate the freaking highs. Celebrate them. Enjoy that moment. Like you deserve it. You worked hard for it, but in the lows, acknowledge it, acknowledge how you feel and, yeah. and don't hide from it because that's, it's reality. And then I think secondly, know that and it might sound contradictory, but everyone's going through something in life. You're not alone. Like mm. there's not one person here who's not had a struggle in some way or form. Everyone's struggles are different. Don't get me wrong. The, the severity is different, but there's always someone else out there. And that's what I used to remind myself is there's people in different countries right now. They're going through war. There's mm. people who are homeless. There's people who are struggling mentally and they can't fix it. They don't have access to fix it, fix it in the people. Yeah. So embrace that you are fortunate to be here and you're not alone. And together, I think if we just, just acknowledge that, um, the world be such a better place. I agree. Great advice. And, uh, I'm so glad that you said yes to this conversation. Um, for those of you that are uh, tuning in. This is already episode 39 of Tiger Talk Thursday, and this is of transitioning to life after sports. But Riley's got a bit of a twist on it for those soccer slash football fans out there. Um, and after you know a life threatening, unexpected car accident, we are seeing her step back on the field. So, where do we find you now? What's next for you? What's what's the big plan? I'm, I'm currently playing in New Zealand, uh, playing in the A League, which is the Australian League. Um, loving my life out here absolutely so confident playing the best version of myself I've ever played like top of my game right now and, and I'm pushing healed? for the Olympic roster you're fully, fully healed. healed fully healed there's not an injury there's nothing wrong with me I'm like a million bucks made of gold um <laughs> you're yeah, shining like you're made, roster. you look like you're a gold color you got that nice tan going on I'm all like pasty white here in Canada um you <laughs> you got a beautiful glow going on no I love it okay thank you, wait. Thank you. yeah so chase awesome. the Olympics and that's what my goal is I want to be on that roster I'm doing everything in my power to be back in uh in the squad and get back on tour with the girls so hopefully um that's what's next if not just keep on pushing the barriers and knocking on doors I love it I love it well yeah, yeah, it's a pleasure hearing from you. I'm going to be watching you and seeing your progression and uh, we're all cheering you on. So thank you so much for contributing to this conversation and uh, we're excited to see what's next for you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Bye.